I moved across to 610 Radio as a senior news reporter in, was it the 60s? I don't know. Sometimes I, I feel as though I died and went to heaven. <laughs> but having emphasized radio a lot, and having looked at its potential in my amateur days, I was not professionally qualified by any means as, a, as an expert in the field. I started to feel that if you put radio out there, given the kind of discussions that were taking place at the time, radio will help you maintain your, your contact with your constituents. And it could be used outside of the studio more effectively than you think. That is my feeling. And I always had this dream of radio being in every home, as it would have become, if once you could afford it at that time, but it's something that you had to afford in the latter times. And I kept saying, why is it that we cannot maintain or have people maintain their contacts through radio. Um, it's unfortunate that most of the programming that you had, both in Radio Trinidad, and Voice of Radio Fusion, um, 610 Radio, apart from the genre that you promoted, you were essentially dealing with music. When television came around, it gave us opportunities that still has have not been exploited as much as they should. I'll give you an example. I got a fellowship um, out of 610 to go to the BBC to train. And I left here and was actually startled by the thought of having to line with some of the key broadcasters in the region, in, in the world. Um, and to, to be able to produce some material. And one day we were pulled into a class session that had to deal with um, producing plays for radio, which was a big thing on the BBC. Just before I traveled, Derek Walcott started that project at 610, recorded most of his material in the form of plays. I used to enjoy going sitting down and watching him and the crew operating it, including Wilbert Holder, I can't remember them now. Um, Bozot Mukandru, I think, was there. If, if not there, surely involved in some aspect of production that resembled the Derek Walcott's plays and so on. And there was a, a, a kind of upsurge of this material on the areas. Um, and I looked at the production and Wilbert Holder and Derek himself and a couple other people who were the actors and actresses of this tremendous project that he was doing. And move forward, here I am now out of Trinidad in London and they are calling us to watch this production as part of our being taught how to do plays for radio. And there was a whole crowd of people producing this, this play. We had people who did balance and control, uh, people who did sound effects, people who did narration. So you had a studio filled with people. And when you listened to the quality that came back, it hit you full in the face. The quality was the top emphasis that one would place when you're doing material for the BBC. And I waited to see 
how all of these people would blend, and they did. But the sound that emerged was just as a sixth-end sound. Or let me say that the sixth-end sound was just as their sound. And there was excellence. And I don't know about the schedule, but here we had this material that should have been promoted and, and, and produced further. And I don't know, it just came to an end one day. I don't know why I was away when it did. But the point I'm trying to make is, in London, there were about 10 or 12 people, 14, 15, doing various things for that production. At 6 10, there were three. And I said to myself, but why is it that, I mean, we have the potential, we have the skill. Why is it that this has never been promoted and pushed and done? And somewhere, somehow, somebody is going to find those tapes one day and hopefully bring it out. I don't know whether they will have the equipment in which they can play it. But you would hear the excellence that Derek Walcott achieved with three persons in a studio versus 12, 14, 15 for a similar project in the United Kingdom. The point I'm trying to make is, sometimes I wonder why is it that we have to always complain about quality of broadcasts when you know, people demonstrated that they could do things, but for some reason, it never moved beyond a particular point. And the Derek Walcott point is something that I, I always place emphasis on when I speak to people about the evolution of radio in this country. And I think that enough effort has, has, has been made to really have these systems form a part of, of something that would last for a long time. Um, and I'm talking about the opening up of the airwaves, which came with the change of government. There's a feeling that, just as, as there was a feeling in the good old days of the voice of Rediffusion and so on, there was a feeling then it heightened that radio and media in general should be control, which is a term we hated. Someone said regulated, I hated it just as well. But we were working with institutions. Uh, by then, 610 Radio had become a government-owned entity. And there were interests in the newspapers of the country, not by governments, but by external uh, entrepreneurs. Um, but the country was poised for an explosion of media in that era when the government was talking about the role of the media in the development of the country. The problem that, that journalists always had with, with it was whose development was it? The people's development or the government development? And so that formed part of the discussion. But we, um, we persevered and we had good programs, but they didn't touch the community, in my um, opinion, in a manner that enabled them to be lasting. Um, a change is about to come again with a system like this one that's, that's being launched. Everything in Trinidad is when things go wrong. The first thing we do is we look at an outside quota to have caused it. Oil, well, oil prices. Gas, well, gas prices. Standards, well, why can't you be not like C CNN? Or why are you not like the BBC? I had a general manager 
at uh, Trinidad and Tobago Television who kept telling me, why can't you do things like CNN? And one day I got so annoyed, I had to tell him one newscast on CNN is done with a budget that we in a year would expand. And I think I made the point to him that people invested in media with an output of quality as a major objective. And not only, I mean, technical quality is what you're going for. And I would tell you that one day I took a tape under the Carib Vision project, which I'll talk about a little, and sent it as a request of the CBU, just put it up on the satellite. And by the time I got back to the station on Juve morning, the material I sent was from um, the shows on the weekend, Mardi Gras and Dimash Gras and so on. And I was beginning to get requests from some places I had never heard about in my life, some places in the Far East, seeking permission to use the material. And they did. And we started to get a couple reactions. Well, why don't you all send us on a regular basis? We couldn't afford to do it. Fact of the matter is we never really gave it much thought, the material that we had. Um, Hazel Redmond's um, program for children. The grand first prize, a trip to the magical kingdom of Walt Disney in Orlando, Florida. We welcome back my friend, advisor, and accompanist, Mr. Morris Connor. Set its mark and had a connection with the population that you saw the parents eagerly wanting their children to participate in this program so that you had a vehicle that could promote young babies to the country and they were talented. I spoke about the plays on radio. You had plays done um, in Trinidad. Uh, Horace James, who was a, a Trinidadian who lived and worked in Britain, he, he was brought home to do this thing and so you had play of the month. And when it came to operas, soap operas, we had one, I don't remember the name now, it's done and broadcast once a week. 